I hope everybody's been enjoying the conference. If you're just joining today for the first time, please check out the exhibitors booths. You can visit Canada's history. You can say, check out the National Film Board, the Bank of Canada. Um, the resources from Elections Canada are wonderful, looking at how women got the vote, looking at the, um, the train, the express train that uh, Indigenous people and their allies took to Ottawa to get uh, Indigenous rights enshrined in Section 35 of our Constitution in 1985. There's some really great resources there. And of course, everything is being recorded. So everything will be up in about a week on our new national SSENC, the SANC, our new national social science educators network. So there's going to be all of the recordings on their YouTube ch channel, as well as resources that our presenters have shared with us. So no worries, those people that uh, have to leave today or can just pop in for a minute. Okay, how many people are in the room, Randy? Looks like we have 18 in the room, including two of you. So we have 16 guests. So 15, I'm here too, okay. so 15 guests. Okay, yeah, we're supposed to only go until 12.30. So um, I would like to uh, get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. I think we're all in the morning time zone. My name is Kelly Main, and as an executive member of OHASTA here in Ontario, um, I've worked all summer uh, with Alberta and Manitoba to create this conference. And I'm very pleased that you've joined us. And I would also like to say thank you to Randy, our tech person. We've had sponsoring from the Association for Canadian Studies who have brought this wonderful platform and tech assistance um, to us as well. Uh, recently, I've stepped back into the role of department head um, in Cambridge, Ontario in the Waterloo Region District School Board. And as a treaty partner and seventh generation settler and educator here on the Haldeman Track, which was promised to the Haudenosaunee or the Longhouse people in 1784. Um, I'm spending a lot of time mobilizing my privilege and energy to learn with them and as well the Anishinaabe people who were here um, before that um, and also the Attawandra on our neutrals were absorbed by the Anishinaabe. So I'm trying to answer the calls to action for educators and um, really I've been very thankful to have so much help from so many people to learn the real truth of treaties and to work with my staff and students to be better treaty partners and better relationships. Um, and so now um, I would like to introduce you to our presenter. And in the before COVID times, I have a really fond memory uh, of driving to Scarborough with a colleague from our board one day after school. Uh, we got so excited about critical thinking and the uh, merits of how inquiry is actually equity education when you teach people how to ask a question, think deeply, unpack thinking skills, and they can learn to express themselves. Um, indeed, we will definitely build a better future. And so today, Marie is going to take her ideas further with us and um, help explore how we in a very real way can rise to the challenge of the times to help um, get out of the paradigm of the racist and sexist and homophobic, et cetera, realities that arise from colonialism. Maria is a PhD candidate uh, who's researching the most impactful pedagogies for climate justice through the lens of citizenship. And before her doctoral studies, she was an educator in the Ontario public school system for over a decade. She's been committed to addressing issues of equity and injustice throughout her career. She has served as a facilitator of the professional learning like I experienced with educators nationally, internationally um, on very powerful complex issues. And so she is trying to nurture active citizenship in classrooms through transformative pedagogies and deep reflexive practices. So building on what Dr. Sean Lassard said on Thursday night and the, um, the call to love that Ningan Sinclair gave us yesterday, I welcome Maria. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, it's wonderful to, to be here with everyone. I'm just trying to share my screen. Yep, we, yeah, we can see you. Beautiful. Okay, well, I welcome everyone here. Um, thank you for, you know, thank you for joining this workshop uh, because, you know, very, the, the, the title's quite explicit. And so if you showed up to this workshop, um, then I, I think it means that we're committed to this work. And so it's, it's wonderful to be here with you. 
Um, I do want to just briefly, Kelly did a wonderful land acknowledgement, but I do want to acknowledge the land that I'm on. I'm on the Dish with One Spoon Treaty territory, and it's very important for me to acknowledge uh, that treaty because I believe that part of truth and reconciliation is regenerating those original treaty relationships, the wampum inspired relationships where there is unseated and stolen territory, and we have to think very critically and deeply about what that means. Um, and the dish with one spoon, it's so important too from a lens of climate justice because the original intent of the dish with one spoon treaty is that there is more than enough to share along these great lakes so long as we are conscious of our one spoon and there are also no knives present i've heard this from a knowledge from several knowledge keepers that there is there are no knives with the dish with one spoon so it is about learning to peaceably share and care for each other I want to acknowledge my teachers um, because my teachers, Kahandakwa Diane Longboat, uh, Ojibwe knowledge keeper, Water Walker, Grandma Shirley John, I want to acknowledge as well, um, Elder Vera White Eye Jones, um, Mohawk Elder, Ojibwe elders, knowledge keepers, leaders. They have been my teachers uh, for many years, and I want to acknowledge that I'm accountable to them <laughs> as, I, as I do this work. I'm accountable to Indigenous communities. I'm, in, I'm accountable to racialized communities. I want to acknowledge um, those who have really impacted my teaching. Uh, Kika Ojo Thompson, who some of you may be familiar with, we went to teachers college together. Uh, Dr. Vidya Shaw at York University, as well as many of the racialized thinkers, um, writers, scholars who are giving us the insights really to do this work. And I want to acknowledge that. I don't position myself as an expert. Um, I, I, I recognize that we, are, we must do this work together. And um, as difficult and complex as it is, it's our work to do. So again, as we do this work, yes, we can expect to be uncomfortable. <laughs> so let's expect that and let's be curious about it. Let's recognize that the work of racial justice isn't easy, it's not comfortable, and it's not linear. It is ongoing, it is iterative, it is inquiry. <laughs> we have that inquiry of how do I do this work? How do I ensure justice? How do I dismantle these systems? That's inquiry and action. So we are engaging in these ongoing inquiries. Um, this workshop in particular, because we have a short period of time, it's been designed to support reflexivity. So I'm going to be inviting you to some individual reflection, but leading to action. So not reflection for its own sake, but reflection that leads to action. And um, really, again, being accountable to what actions we need to be taking in education to dismantle racial injustice and become actively anti-racist educators. Um, I'm going to I'm going to invite you to complete a poll. Uh, so I want to ask, you know, again, anyone in this group who identifies as a member of a racialized group and also just to identify the grade range you teach as well. And uh, I want to share with you as I was looking for statistics about Alberta's uh, teach like the demographics of Alberta, I could not find statistic, doesn't mean they don't exist, but I couldn't find them. Um, in terms of how many teachers identify as racialized, the only statistic I could find is that 3% of graduates of teacher education programs in Alberta identify as First Nations, Métis or Inuit. What I could find about Ontario, the Ontario context is that um, 26 percent of the Ontario population identifies as racialized or in, the, in that survey it was part of a uh, you know part of a minority group was how they use the language I'm using different language but 10 percent of all secondary teachers in the province as a whole are racialized nine percent of all elementary teachers are racialized in Toronto we have 47 percent of the population identifies racialized but 20% of secondary teachers identifies racialized, 18% of elementary. So here's what's true. The vast majority of the teaching profession in both provinces is comprised of white women. So <laughs> when we're talking about dismantling uh, white supremacy and the majority of educators are white women, that, that, that it, is, it is everyone's work to do, but it is our work to do. And it is not the work of only racialized educators to do this work. In fact, 
it is it there are there are particular difficulties to do that work. Um, so again, we see even in our own workshop, we see kind of a you know a bit of a similar breakdown. We have a majority uh, who do not identify, and I didn't ask about gender, um, but I just see even through the chat that again it seems to be from my 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 luck that again it's mostly women in this group. So what I do want to say. Um, in, re in relation to that is we have a very short period of time in this workshop. Um, we don't have a lot of time to build that kind of trusting community in this online forum. But I do, we, I do wanna say that it's really important that we you know, provide this space for the deeper critical reflection, um, the conversations that are really, really important. Dialogue and bravery is integral to this work. Um, but we also have to think about the design of the space because folks are impacted differently based on their identity and experiences. So bearing that in mind, when we get to the halfway point where I will, we, we will be inviting you into breakout rooms, um, I want to provide an option if you are racialized and you do not want to join those breakout groups, um, you can opt out of being in those breakout groups because we have not been able to really build that community. And I want to acknowledge just how things may impact you differently as, as the majority of you know, uh, white teachers are grappling. And so I, I leave that in your hands um, to decide what you want to do and how you want to um, you know, navigate this, this space. So I'm gonna invite us into a question together. What are the most impactful actions I can take to dismantle racist legacies in education? So I, I invite you right now to just jot down some initial thoughts. Think about your particular context where you have some decision-making power available to you. Because I recognize that, you know, dependent on where you are, you are, uh, you know, you are navigating, um, you know, diff different points of policy, different points of culture within your school, but where you have decision-making power as an educator, what are some of the most impactful actions you can take? And I'll give you just a minute to get some initial thoughts. And as people are, are thinking about that, Maria, I'm, I'm just reminded again how COVID has interrupted my circles. You know, kids are supposed to be in my school board facing forward. We're not supposed to be really doing group work. We have all of these crazy restraints when you see how the kids interact when they leave the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to encourage you to keep this thought space throughout the workshop and just add to it. So, so again, thinking about the impactful actions. So when we're thinking about actions, I encourage you think about short term. <laughs> what could you do today, tomorrow, next week? What are some medium term actions? What are some longer term actions? Are you, you know, thinking big about ways you wanna transform if you're a department head or ways in which you want to really transform the reading list um, you know, within your courses? So think in terms of all three because all three are necessary and, and not just one over the other. All three are necessary. And Linda's saying she ensures she has a wide variety of novels and historical references that show diversity in my classroom. Okay, so definitely so that's, that's an action. We're gonna keep reflecting on how we can be most impactful in dismantling. I also think it's important that we consider the principles that ground us as we engage in this work. So I will share with you my current principles. I have three principles that I am grounded in as I'm doing this work of dismantling white supremacy. And they're on the left and then I explain them. Um, healing and transforming legacies of historical trauma because that's racism is trauma, racism is violence. It requires deep presence and commitment. It is not something you check in and out of, it is ongoing. White supremacy is my problem as a, as a white educator, right? As I, it is my problem. It is not someone else's problem. And the way for me to do this work because it is 
it is rooted in these legacies of pain is I need to have integrity and love and justice as I do this work. I believe that that is what leads us to freedom as human beings. That is what leads us to societies of flourishing and beauty. And so those are my principles. You know, I want to contribute to healing. I know it's ongoing. It is my problem and love and justice. I'm going to keep coming back even when it's very difficult. That's the vision. So I have to think about how I move in this world, how others are impacted by my whiteness. That's part of this work. I have to, you know, I have to be accountable. I will be corrected. I have been corrected. I have to get over whatever fragility. It's not enough for me to cling to this identity as being a good white person who's not racist. It doesn't matter. I'm immersed in a culture and a set of institutions. It has impacted me. I can assume that I am infused with racist um, ideas, even if, even if I do not want to be racist, I have to continue to do that work. So let's start there so that we don't, you know, use all of our emotional labor because we have things to do. We've got to, you know, roll up our sleeves and get to it. We're going to make mistakes. It's going to be difficult. We have, it's work and we have to do that work. And also that, that undoing racism liberates me as a white person from perpetuating a set of beliefs and systems that cause tremendous pain and injustice. So it is, this is also an act of liberation for all of us. Um, and so that, those are some of my principles. So I encourage you to think about your grounding principles to do this work. I have developed um, a, a framework. It's just an invitation to support our thinking and our actions. Um, this is based on the Critical Thinking Consortium's Framework for Thinking Classroom, but I have disrupted <laughs> the framework. Uh, you know, I've talked to the executive for, for this work of how do we dismantle those educational legacies through reflexive praxis and accountable action. So I'm going to move us through a series of questions that relates to each one of these sandboxes of, you know, the critically thoughtful ways of disrupting white supremacy. So you'll notice these sandboxes are shaping the climate to support anti-racist thinking and accountable action, creating those opportunities for reflexive practice of educators and of students, centering racialized voices, experiences, and knowledges, and nurturing critical consciousness through and within education. So I wanna provide this framework as, as a guide, as a help to, you know, for us to get in there. It doesn't mean it's a perfect framework, but th this is a starting point um, for this. And I'm gonna ask you, and in the chat, just to, just to share your thoughts, uh, to what extent do you agree with this statement? The statement is, we cannot challenge white supremacy in our classrooms unless we are simultaneously or concomitantly challenging it within ourselves as educators and leaders, particularly if our identities are more closely aligned with whiteness. So do you, to what extent do you agree? Do you strongly agree? Do you somewhat agree? Do you disagree? Okay, so strongly agree, Alexis says. Same, same, agree. Okay, so again, feel free to, to, to add your thoughts. Um, you know, this, this notion of white identity is, is complex, right? It is a social construction. We know that historically, usually based on skin color, but we also know it's contextual. <laughs> it's dynamic, it's fluid, it's intersectional. I, as a Greek woman, right? I know that my parents, when they came here, were in, in their own way racialized. So, you know, in, in terms of the Northern European ideal, there's, there is a racialization, how the Irish, there's a book about, um, when the Irish were black, that's what the book is called, that explores how the Irish were racialized. So it is contextual, dynamic, fluid, and intersectional. Um, it is influenced by socio-political and economic context. And it still is salient. Our skin color still remains a profound point of salience. And so that's a starting point for this, recognizing all of the complexity. Um, I don't know how many of you, and feel free to use uh, your reaction emoji, like a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I won't take it as a thumbs up or thumbs down, just a yes or a no. 
How many of you have, in, have done the power flower, you know, as a starting point in your own journey? How many of you have done, you know, some of these activities uh, around reflexive positionality. So understanding our social location and identity. So how many, you can use the yes button just to share. Okay, some, I see a yes, I see a no, no, not yet. Okay, no. So really good to know because this is, a, this is an important starting point, right? Where we start to map where we are privileged and where we may not be experiencing privilege. So we may be privileged in, in terms of uh, the way that our skin color has privilege within the society, but we may, we may be at a disadvantage in terms of our sexual orientation, right? This is, this is the theory Kimberly Crenshaw is getting at with intersectionality, but also that, that it's, not a, it's, it's not an equal, um, it, it's not equal. Like if you are a black woman, it's, it, that actually magnifies the oppression. If you are a black lesbian, the oppression is magnified. That's actually the theory of intersectionality that most people kind of miss is that it, it, it actually has a lot of nuance in terms of how it plays out. So I do have a resource list I'm gonna share with you and I've got a link to the Power Flower um, for you to do. And I also wanna share, there's a work of Leslie Ann Noel, who's an incredible design thinker. And she also engages her design students in this frame on the left of positionality. So this is part of the work is, do, is doing that critical autobiography of how, how our identity privileges us in certain ways and in ways we are disadvantaged and, and starting to recognize the water that we are swimming in sociologically and politically. And white supremacy is really, it's the institutionalization of whiteness and white privilege and the historical, social, political, and economic systems and structures that contribute to its continued dominance. I think finding bodies of indigenous children this summer is one of the clearest examples of white supremacy, of colonialism, absolutely, but also white supremacy. The institutionalization of whiteness as the ideal and the ways in which that violence is carried out within our system. Right? We have to be able to name this in order to change it. Right, That when we look at the demographics, that is showing us the institutional structural, structural privileging of whiteness across our institutions. Right, When we look at curricula, when we look at our own educational experiences, think about the ways that whiteness has been centered. Even if we you know, had a diverse book here or there, the reality is we've been steeped in this, right? This has been part, this is part of that institutionalization. So we have to undo, unlearn and move forward. So I'm gonna invite you right now. Um, this is one of our sandboxes. The first sandbox is, is part of disrupting white supremacy is centering, not just adding, centering racialized voices, experiences and knowledges. So think about your courses, right? Think about you know, work that's being done. How do we center racialized voices, experiences, and knowledges? So when I tell you, for example, that I'm accountable to racialized communities, that's one way that I center the voices, experiences, and knowledges that direct me, that actually push me out of my own comfort <laughs> to saying, this is what you need to do. You need to do this workshop. <laughs> Right, even if you're not comfortable, even if you're feeling, you know, this is actually what you need to do. So in centering voices, experiences, and knowledges, I also get direction, right? So thinking about that, I'm gonna invite you into thinking about these questions, okay? And just to take a moment, and maybe some of these will spark some ideas about um, some of the actions you wanna take, okay? So I'll just give you a couple of, of, of moments here to reflect on these questions. Or sorry, these prompts, <laughs> not just questions.
And would you like anybody to put um, ideas in the chat or this is just our own journaling? Uh, it's, it's totally up to folks. I, I, will, I encourage that right now people may not um, want to share, but I encourage people to share if they absolutely want to share. This is what I'm doing. Like, let's say I'm really taking this on and here's something I'm doing and you want to share your ideas with us, please do so. And what I'm hoping to do, and, and I want to acknowledge that um, some of this work was developed, we I worked with a small group of teachers over a year last year with, uh, I think, um, their mentor teachers, and we worked through, we were working through these issues. And so I want to acknowledge that work, that this, this, is, this was part of what we were doing as a group, um, you know, to, to really do that dismantling work of white supremacy. And again, engaging in that reflexive positionality. So with the power flower, what you can see is along the outer petals, you have what is really the dominant, most privileged identities historically. And then you place your own identity in those inner petals, right? And then you start to recognize where are you aligned with the dominant and the privilege and where are you not? And it gives you a better sense of your own power location. Again, next sandbox, you know, to what extent do you do the following? And I have some links on critical autobiography practice that's been considered very powerful in doing this work, whether for just yourself as an educator or depending on what you're teaching, how you wanna bring that practice to your students. Right? And again, consistently engage with people and materials that challenge your mental models, right? So important that challenge those understanding because we have been steeped in whiteness, we can't even recognize a lot of the time. Uh, so we absolutely have to constantly engage. Again, just wanting to give folks a moment to sort of consider these actions in your own practice. And just seeing in the chat, so, you know, Alexa is saying the system that we ask all students to engage with has been created by a white colonial institution. Yes. <laughs> Even the way units are constructed around defining moments for whom are those moments lies? Critical question. And Jason says, here's a thought. So many of the virtues and values surrounding learning are rooted in a traditional Protestant industrial era of productivity and usefulness. Absolutely, absolutely. And I just want to say too, very briefly, you know, based on my own research around climate justice and the growing mental health crisis of young people, education must respond and must transform in order to support young people right now. Um, and, and those values, uh, some of these underlying values that have contributed to the crisis have to be interrogated and have to be disrupted for the mental well being of our students. And we now are gaining growing evidence. Um, about those impacts. So I want us to take a, watch a little bit of a clip. Um, this is a, a clip of uh, Kika Ojo Thompson of the Kojo Institute. And um, this is, a, I think a really powerful clip on the legacies. And she has a series of three videos that she actually did for the Waterloo region. So Kelly for, <laughs> for Kitchener Waterloo. Um, I'm gonna show a little bit of a clip uh, for us to think about again what we're getting at when we're talking about disrupting these legacies oh you know what just give me one sec i want to uh i want to optimize my video like i was taught so give me one moment to do that yes okay good 
it is optimized. Beautiful. Okay. The legacies are um, the root and core of the powerful unexamined ideas. And the spaces that these ideas get proliferated and reproduced are our institutions. So it is in our institutions, it is in the institutions like our education, um, our boards of education, um, it is in our, through our media, it is through our child welfare institutions and our policing institutions that the ideas of the legacies um, get reproduced and spread and normalized. And so identifying that what we see as the tip of the iceberg is really rooted in ideas that have become powerful unexamined ideas and that at the root of those is the legacies. So, you know, is a, is a really important notion. So it is through colonialism that we came to understand the West as the dominant space, as powerful, as all-knowing, as the place that knowledge comes from. It is through slavery that we came to understand that whiteness was superior and ideal and that black and all things African were the worst, problematic, demonized, etc. It is through patriarchy that we come to understand the, um, the capacity of, of, of the masculine and the dominance of the masculine and the subordination and sort of weakness of the feminine. Etc. And so it is the legacies that actually inform us about how we see the world and what is powerful and what is not powerful. And so it begs the big question, now what? Right? And, and what does this mean for us today? And so I think it means a couple of things. I think for one, it's really important that we acknowledge why we're here in these situations, in these setups. So when we look at, in this setup, excuse me, so when we look at trends, when we look at the fact, for example, that women make, what is it now, 80 to 90 cents on the dollar to every man, that we don't think to ourselves, well, that is as a result of women simply not being as, as, as effective in the workplace. They're not, they don't have as, as uh, their skills are not as, as sharp. You know, that in fact, it is rooted in, patri in, in patriarchy. And, and that it is patriarchy that caused this so many, you know, so many centuries uh, later. And so, for men, it is the acknowledgement that patriarchy benefits them and that because of patriarchy, they are presumed to know. They are presumed to be capable and presumed to be able to do whatever the task may be. And also because of that same patriarchy, women are presumed to not be able to do, to, to not be able, to not be capable, to not be effective. And so like, acknowledging the root of those ideas, acknowledging how legacies set us up as beneficiary or set us up in subordination. And, and if I am the dominant in, in, the, in the story, if I am the beneficiary, that I understand that those that are not um, achieving as I am achieving or have not um, arrived where I have arrived or have access to what I have access, that I acknowledge and keep in mind that that is happening because of the, because of the legacies and not because I am naturally better or they are naturally worse. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with a little bit of food for thought, I'm going to uh, invite you into uh, breakout rooms. So, um, Kelly, would you mind setting up breakout rooms of, of, of about three? Sure, okay. actually, I'm going to ask Randy to do oh, that. Yeah, um, Randy, please. <laughs> and also, I'm just going to remind people that breakout rooms are not recorded. So what happens in a breakout room stays in a breakout room. And um, again, you don't have to participate if you don't want to. But um, I'm really thankful for this, uh, this opportunity that you're giving us. So we want about three people. We have about 19 participants. Okay. And how long would you like us to be in the breakout room for? Yeah. So I'm going to say, let's come back here at um, 12, tw uh, 20. So it gives us about 10. I know, it's, I know it'll fly and it'll be short, <laughs> but just a little moment to connect. And I encourage you to just you know, talk about the most impactful actions that you can take within your context or, you know, um, and again, a reminder that folks do not have to join a breakout room. I will stay behind in this room uh, for anybody who, uh, you know, wants to, wants to opt out. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. 
And is Randy, uh, is Randy here? Just checking. Maybe I will be making breakout rooms. Oh, there's Randy. Maybe not. Okay, let me create some here. Oops, now you're muted, Maria. Okay, yep, here we go. Yep, we're ready to go. <laughs> I'm going to join a breakout room too. Yes, I will be sharing a link, uh, links for the clip and other other short videos. Okay, hey, so um, folks who are here, I mean, if, if folks want to um, chat, please feel free to chat if you would like to just uh, take some time, um, you know, to kind of reflect on on what's happened so far. I, I leave that to you, but I'm here if you have any questions or comments or um, anything you want to share. Uh, I'll, I, I'm here, and if I don't hear from you, I'm just going to kind of organize uh, for the for the second half of the presentation. So you let me know. I'm really good either way.
Welcome back. I know folks are slowly going to start to make their way back from the breakout rooms. Um, how was your conversation, Sheila? Sorry, I'm not sure if you're talking. I'm not able to hear you, just in case you are. So welcome back, everyone. I hope, I know it was short. <laughs> I hope it gave you an opportunity to, um, you know, to, to dig into some conversations. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot, it's just so hard in such a, such a short session. And I want to, um, you know, I do want to give you, give you some, so, some more things to think about as we end, um, you know, in the last 10 minutes, I sort of still have it <laughs> packed in, but um, I have put a, a couple of PDFs. So let me know if you can't see those in the chat. Uh, one is a series of links just to continue developing uh, for more, more resources, as well as a PDF of the key slides. So I know that some things are going very quickly, um, but, but there are some key slides and I'm glad you're having great conversations. I'm sure they could continue and an hour is really so, such little time for us to, um, you know, to engage in these issues. Um, I, I did though want to highlight this study because I think it's very important and I always like, I really, one, one of the roles I love to play is empowering teachers um, with, you know, to do the change they need to do. And one of the ways to do that is with credible, relevant, recent research. And this study that was done uh, by Cider and Graves in 2020, so quite recent. Um, in terms of critical consciousness and how we see definitely blowbacks, uh, particularly in the U.S., against critical race theory, against the very pedagogies and approaches that are actually, uh, you know, supporting students to develop a social analysis, political agency, and social action. So any attempts to do that within schooling, there's a pushback. Um, but Cider and Graves share from research that the higher critical consciousness is actually associated with higher self-esteem, higher political engagement, higher professional aspirations, academic engagement, even higher academic achievement. So all the things that we are committed to within education that we say we want to encourage, the critical consciousness, and, but yet the very thing that often gets marginalized um, in our approaches actually nurtures the very things that we are aiming to do, right? Because, and, and as they say, being able, understanding those systems and helping students recognize the ways that, oppress it, that oppression plays itself out gives them the resilience in the face of racism, in the face of homophobia, in the face of you know, gender oppression. Um, it gives them resilience because they start to understand this is not something to internalize and that they can do something about it. So by nurturing agency, we actually have, uh, we are actually contributing to well-being in students. So agency and well-being are directly linked and the research shows that. So when we help students uh, understand that they have the capacity through their actions and decision making to change the very things that limit our well-being and hinder our well-being, that's one of the most powerful things that we can be doing as educators. So in, in the um, links that I did put in the PDF, there is a link to this paper because uh, it's, it's, it's open access. And again, I encourage folks to use this when they're trying to make a case about the importance of critical consciousness in their context. Um, and um, excuse me, sorry, Maria, sorry. we just we don't see the PDF in the chat. You might have shared it in uh, in the main room when we were in breakout rooms. So we didn't all get the, the link. No worries. Oh, and I noticed it. Oh, there there it is. OK, I will. I'm going to uh, just at the end of this talk, I'm going to I'm going to put that back in there. Thank okay. you. I will, Thank I will you. put it back in. So don't leave before I put that in. Um, Okay, so sorry, I have a very sensitive mouse and it, it always does this to my slides. Um, so again, the, the, the other sandbox to think about, and you'll get a PDF of this, is how do we nurture that critical consciousness in education, right? Um, the critical autobiography work that I spoke about is quite important. Sharing your thinking and mistakes publicly and acknowledge, acknowledging and engaging with tensions that arise respectfully but firmly challenge the stereotypical oppressive mental models of others. 
explicitly encourage and teach in ways that name structural injustices and the imagining of ways to create more just realities. That's the beautiful, joyful work is like, let's, what would it be like, <laughs> right? If these, if these oppressive structures weren't in operation, let's like, let's embody that. Let's feel what's possible to give us the motivation and, you know, something that we can continue to work towards together. And uh, I did wanna just point out, um, thinking about the most important frameworks, I, I do think diversity, inclusion, belonging are important. Um, they have a role to play in this work. At the same time, if we're not really centering the anti-oppression frameworks in education, we're not actually getting at the root causes and issues. Right? So anti-oppression frameworks recognize that oppression. They are, um, they, they really do expose the historical, structural and systemic use of power. So we need to really make sure that anti-oppression frameworks are very much a part of our, our teaching and learning experiences at the same time that we are also working with diversity, inclusion and belonging. But I think without anti-oppression, we're not going to achieve because that power goes uninterrogated, right? And, and we need to interrogate the power that's in operation. And again, um, the videos that I shared of Kika, there's three of them. And I think this point is really important about disaggregating data. So when the Alberta teachers has that report and doesn't tell us about racialized educators, we, we, we are missing important information. If you got rave reviews from 90% of your students, that's an accomplishment. But if the 10% were the racialized students, that's an issue, right? And so we have to be paying attention to disaggregated data as we do this work, uh, because it really matters and it's going to give us really important information. And, and finally, um, the, you know, the final sandbox is around shaping the climate to support anti-thinking, anti-racist thinking, whoops, I told you, sensitive mess, um, <laughs> anti-racist um, thinking and accountable action. So we need to create a caring community, but it has to be critical and we have to hold each other accountable. Um, we, we need to be having these conversations out in the open and, and, and putting things out there um, challenging the centering of whiteness and white norms as standards for community values, um, using the data and structures to set anti-oppressive and equity goals, setting audacious goals for your department, for your school, for your classroom that are dismantling those oppressive barriers for students. And, you know, use the design thinking, um, the action oriented, the prototyping of new ideas that dismantle those barriers even if you don't have the data yet, um, you know, set those goals. So again, just wanting to return, it's, this is an invitational framework. It's not a perfect framework. Uh, it's just, you know, it's something that is based on many years of reflection and action and um, again, being accountable to racialized communities, but it doesn't mean that this is uh, perfect. However, I hope that it's provided a framework you know, to just become uh, more bold in, in this work that is so needed in these times um, and, and hopefully some motivation. So uh, I encourage you again, hopefully at the end of this session, just to spend a little time really mapping your next steps and your action plan for what you are going to do tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, three years from now, um, to continue to dismantle these racist legacies and to really center the work of anti-racism in, in your work, um, because it can be centered in all the work that, that you are passionate about, I guarantee, <laughs> because, because it's all around us. Um, I, will, I will also share, uh, actually, let me, let me share with you my contact information. And I will also, um, in just a moment, if you've written that down, I'm also gonna share a PDF of key slides. I know that was a lot. Um, but, but, but in an hour, I wanted to give as much as possible, um, you know, to, to sort of have some things to really think about and chew on and hopefully support you in your context 
to keep going with this work, um, you know, and to recognize that it, it, it's, it's, it's engaging, important, it's difficult and necessary, but also it is joyful work. Um, if we're talking about reimagining and dismantling these, these legacies of violence and oppression and harm, um, that we find joy in, in the possibilities of that. So I will, uh, I will put those PDFs in and Kelly, I, I turn it over to you. Um, thank you. Yes, thank as, you. as you help share all of your, your brilliance, I wanna thank you so much, Maria, on behalf of all of our organizations this weekend. Um, and I would also ask Alexis is just saying if you could put your contact info because I know I will be asking you to present to our history heads in the Waterloo Region District School Board. Um, so thank you for helping us with that question, now what? Um, in my small group, we just talk about that, that idea of the limited time, right? We just don't seem to have enough time um, to do anything. But with these kind of uh, models, with these kind of challenges to our, our mental models, um, it can really help us fight for and with each other. And I really love this, this idea of creating the change. I found once we, we teach anti-oppression, like in my grade 12 challenge and change, or it doesn't really matter what, what class I'm in, the kids' eyes light up. If you talk about um, colonialism and how it's impacted them, you get the kids because they understand now. They have the words, like you're saying. And I've seen amazing kids do things in our Black Student Union. We start an Indigenous Student Association um, in my Gender Sexuality Awareness Club. And now these ripples are bearing fruit. And now they're going off into their post-secondary um, careers. And they are the change because we have given them the words. And then they can help us with the work. And we can multiply our joys. And so thank you for your optimism and thank you for your hope. And um, I'm just going to encourage people to hang with the conference if you can check anything out um, in terms of the exhibitors booths, in terms of watching the pre-recorded se uh, sessions, which are also wonderful and will be up afterwards. So you'll be able to find this material again on the YouTube channel from SANC and you'll be able to um, get these resources as well that Maria is sharing um, on the Lahasta website and other places. And by the way, you can share them with your your colleagues as well. There, there won't be a, a cost associated. So thank you, Maria. You're a busy person. Have a good rest after all the presentations you've done this week. And thank you to everybody as well. Thank you, everyone. I do. I have posted the PDFs in the chat, so please uh, make sure you grab those. And thank you. And I, I would like ideally, I wish we could have like a, two days to just do this work in community, go deep you know, get in there. <laughs> but hopefully in an hour, it was like a little bit of a, a spark to keep us going. So thank you for your work and for showing up today um, to do this work. I really want to acknowledge you. Thank you. We'll leave, we'll leave this up for a few minutes just so people can. You're welcome, Janet. Thank you, everybody, for the wonderful comments. To Maria, I know you want to talk to her again. I know I certainly did after that one hour in Scarborough, um, because these critical challenges that are equity-based with the, the tools and the um, vocabulary. Once students have done their power flower for themselves, not only us, um, and then once they've seen their, where their privileges are, um, but where also where their deficits are, um, we can all understand each other better. And it just is an amazing way to start out every class. Um, so I've learned so much from you and I'm hoping to learn more. So, and good luck with the doctorate, by the way, that's, uh, took my husband 20 years, but he did it during COVID last year. So <laughs> it can happen. Oh, it doesn't take me that long. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. Thanks all everyone. The, all the best. I'll, 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 I'll hang out just for a little bit and just in case, um, if we're allowed, can I hang out for five yeah. minutes just in case people I have think, any questions, I'm happy to do that. Yes, I think Randy won't uh, pull us off stage. So yeah, if anybody <laughs> wants to ask her a pressing question. Yeah, for sure. any pressing Sorry, I don't see it in the chat. So I wonder, is there a different chat area that I would go to to find the PDFs? Did you did you scroll? Are you are you logging in from a, a like not a desktop or laptop by chance? That's right. Yeah, it's from a phone. Yeah, oh, so okay. it doesn't it's it doesn't show up for folks. Okay. This is what I've learned. Um, okay. So it will be available, as Kelly said. Um, and you can also, if you grab my email, I'd be happy to just pop it in an email to you. If you say, you say right. question, can you send that to me? <laughs> Thanks, I grabbed your email. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, that's great.
Thank you. So, oh, Maria, here's a question. Yeah. Could I ask for an impactful action? So um, an impactful action could be that you are going to um, look through your syllabus, your curriculum, and that you are going to look at it through a le an anti-racist lens, thinking about those sandboxes. So how much are the experiences of racialized people centered in your curriculum, for example, right? Like, it, is it just a cut, like, you, you know, you sort of do, we, we've done a little bit about, um, you know, Black experience in Canada and, and, you know, covered that on a, you know, a couple of days, but then we're still kind of sticking to a fairly traditional, you know, cologne. That, that's an example, like, look at your syllabus, look at it critically, look at it through these lenses, think about, and it doesn't matter, it's, it's, especially if, let's say, your, your class, let's say, because I've heard this as well, like, my class, uh, people say, well, my class is mostly white students. This actually, actually, this work is more important in that context, and you can go deeper. So I've taken a risk of doing Jane Elliott, if you're familiar with her work, brown eyes, blue eyes, controversial, but some of the most impactful work I did with an all white group, an all white class. Um, and so we should be actually continuing to center this in, in, you know, in classes. So that's one example that I can think of. Um, and, you know, and there's, there's a number like doing your own power flower is an impactful action because once you start to become aware of your, your location and social identity and you start dealing with that, like dealing with, yes, I have these privileges because I'm heterosexual and I need to learn more. I need to immerse myself and understand. And it's my responsibility to do that learning, to read and to participate in workshops and to center different experiences, to challenge the mental models that I've grown up with or the mental models that have been part of my own education. So that's another example of an impactful action. But I want you to determine what those are, <laughs> right? Like, you know, ba based on centering an anti-racist approach. Thanks, Linda. Thanks so much. Is there anyone else who has any questions or comments? I just wanted to say I really like what you said about um, that kind of a tendency to kind of sprinkle uh, a little bit of um, other voices or other experiences through the curriculum, um, it, which is ultimately still built around this framework of, uh, I guess, this white supremacist sort of outlook. I mean, the Canadian history course is a classic example of a course that really has for a long time been exactly that. And, uh, you know, I feel like the efforts we are taking are, are good, but also sometimes I feel like it's exactly that. And if you'll pardon the expression, it sometimes feels like you're putting lipstick on a pig, uh, you know, <laughs> and yeah. uh, anyway, oh, yeah. it, it is a long game. Uh, yes. but, um, but, you know, at the same time, I'm what I'm saying to people, it is, but I think there is an urgency because of the climate crisis. I think the climate crisis is actually an opportunity where all these issues actually come together. And, and we do need more radical change. I've, I, I'm getting very comfortable with radical change because when I see the evidence about what's going on with youth mental health globally, we have to shift course, you know? like you know, we should have been doing that as, as we were getting evidence about how racialized communities have been impacted, right? And that has to be centered because they're the front lines of the, these impacts. We've seen that in COVID, we're seeing it with climate change. So we actually have to get out of our comfort zones here <laughs> because there is an urgency, you know, to center this work, to center the work of anti-racism, to center the work of climate justice, um, yeah, so that that's what I say to that. I, 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 it is a long game, and it's like, but we've got to, we've got to move too, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but as we know, as we just saw, institutions are inherently slow to change, right? That's why societies create them to create stability. So, as a classroom teacher in a white racist structure, it's easy to burn out. Right? It's yeah. easy to give up. <laughs> That's why we need communities of practice. Whatever, whatever that is, 
that gives teachers nourishment to persevere. And there's multiple, there's multiple, um, you know, there's multiple groups like racialized educators need their communities of practice. They need their affinity groups because they experience this work differently and they experience the impacts inequitably and differently. So they need communities of practice. T teachers who are really on the front lines of climate change, they need communities of practice because like, because the reality is we're in multiple crises. So the only way we're gonna move through those is through collective action. And that also really disrupts the individualized, you know, th th so much has been individualized. Teachers get things individualized, like put on their backs, you know, same thing is happening for our students. So we have to disrupt that individualized conception and move into collective action and communities of practice to sustain us. That's the only way that I see kind of to, to really stay in this for the long haul of what it's going to take what it is taking and what it's going to continue to take sadly i need to interrupt now it is <laughs> it is time to go there okay. is another group starting in five minutes so uh thank all you right. all so much and thank enjoy. you Ciao. thank you randy thank you maria thanks, 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 thanks. bye-bye <laughs>